One day, the curator of the collection showed us a kimono that was a favorite of, of all of the designers there. And it's actually a 16th century kimono, but it looks so modern. It's a beautiful abstract asymmetrical kimono showing um, kind of a jar of liquid that's spilling from the shoulder right to the, to the, down to the hand diagonally. It makes you question what is modern. I mean, right. that kimono from the 16th century, you can call modern. That, I mean, I can see somebody wearing that today. So, and that is also the designers are looking at these historical kimonos for that reason, because that inspires and informs their making today. Hi, Vivian. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for being for here. On. We like guests to introduce themselves a little bit you know, who you are and what you what you love to do and what you do. Well, I mean, right now I'm working at the Dallas Museum of Art as the Lupe Murkison Curator of Contemporary Art here. And I've been working here on a little over two years now, so relatively still feel fresh and new since I got here right before the pandemic. So oh. <laughs> most of my curation has been virtually done. So it's been an interesting journey. But actually I'm from Dallas, so it's a nice homecoming for me. And yeah. when I was in high school, right. that was my first museum job was here. So it's very special to be back at the museum that I started out with or I grew up with. Oh, That's wow. pretty amazing. What drew you to art as a young woman? Like, what was it that you wanted to work in a museum? Well, I always was drawn to art. My father, who was an engineer, <laughs> who you wouldn't think has anything to do with art, but he would every Sunday, so I guess you could call him like a Sunday painter, every weekend, he would relax, um, find some freedom around just painting. He was painting ink paintings. And so just watching him being free from his frustrations in life in general. And I think I uh, took away a lot from that. He made a mess out of the house, <laughs> as you can imagine, with ink. Mm -hmm. but I really enjoyed that uh, messiness, I guess, and that creativity, and that is the freedom that art, art allows, that free expressivity of, and creativeness of each individual. And then I started making art too. I was an art history major in college at UT Austin. Then I figured out I wasn't a great artist. <laughs> I, I probably couldn't make a living, but I did love to write as well. So this is just a perfect combination of my two loves, writing and art. So I majored in art history and kind of the rest is history. So it's been great to especially work with the public to make that connection, which is what the museum does. Now, do you remember the first time you saw a kimono? Yeah, I can't remember exactly the first time I saw a kimono, but I'm guessing this also leads into the project I did before I came to the DMA. Most exhibitions that I've seen of kimonos have been about the history of the kimono or some particular period or perhaps social theme that it relates to. And that is just the experience most of us that's not living in Japan, especially where it is a very much thriving part of culture there. And it was the common clothing for regular people until World War II when it became too expensive. So when I met the kimono house called Chizo, which is based in Kyoto, they've been around since 1555 as oldest, older than the U.S. <laughs> yeah. You want to think of it like that. Did you meet somebody from there or how did you come to be familiar with them? So I did an exhibition before this. I was working at the Wooster Art Museum. I worked with Christine Starkman, who was the curator of Asian art there. And so we, we just kept in touch ever since then. And she was in Kyoto. This is, I think, in 2015, so a while ago. And she came across this beautiful store that had no sign outside it. <laughs> they kind of already got a sense of the exclusivity or the clientele that they work with. And then she one day just walked into the shop late at night and just surprised they're open and just beautiful kimonos, beautiful, um, the level that they work at. And then she learned that they were founded in 1555 and they have such great history. They were the kimono makers for the court and they're still creating kimonos at such a high level. Where is it art? It's not like the tourist, <laughs> the kimonos for tourists. Then we just met a few months later in New York. We were just having lunch and she mentioned this and she said, wouldn't it be great if we did something with them? And so that's always been an interest of mine too. I mean, it kind of once through my whole curatorial practice is thinking about these connections and my interest and my training is con contemporary art but definitely thinking about how everything connects I mean contemporary art in many ways 
will be his history, like 100 years from now, contemporary artists. So it's um, a very interesting idea, in the contemporary. So, so was that the thing that the idea was that it was, you were seeing something from 50, it goes all the way back to 1500s, but they're actually always making it new every they're day? Always, yeah, exactly, exactly. They're always innovating. That's how they're able to, I don't want to say exactly survive, because fashion in that way is always so quick and right. always having to be of the moment. And But they have done it so well that they've been around for more than four centuries. Can you help out the audience a little bit to explain, like, it's traditional garb for who? Did everyone get to wear it? Like, I need a, a little bit of, like, is it a class thing? And also, when you think about innovating, I mean... I have no knowledge of this. So I want to understand, is it the innovation on the on the fabrics? Like, because is it a fixed thing with the, you know, what what can what can change? And just a little history, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, definitely. Of the kimono itself, it's eight panels. And where the innovation happens is in the techniques, the ornamentation of the surface. The form itself hasn't changed for centuries. But in many ways, that's the whole point. The canvas of the cloth is what's important and what artists in innovate with. So we met a lot of textile artists. And what was so special about working with Chizo was to learn about the kimono through a 21st century maker's eyes, too. So definitely, they were thinking of how to make techniques quicker, how to also work with craftsmen that are working at the highest level that you can find today about creating new inventions of how to work quickly, but also maintaining that same level. And so they got to many awards, even in the 1800s, they were part of a lot of world fairs. They were in Philadelphia too, getting awards for the innovations and in techniques, especially they're most well known for the paste resist technique called you then, but there's so many different kinds of use in techniques too. So it's just the innovation in that way and the ornamentation. They also use gold leaf, a spectacular embroidery. And also they have about 600 artisans that work for them. And they really are kind of sustaining this level of craftsmanship too because of them. Is it been a family? Is it like who, who owns it so that the continuity comes through from 1500? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so it's the Nishimura family. So three generations of Nishimura have been continuously innovating this technique. And so there's a, a different generations that also have become patrons of artists, especially in the 1800s, when a lot of artists were no longer having the court patronize them as Japan modernized. Places such as Chizo are starting to patronize them also for the export market, especially. So they were also focusing on international clientele and the international market more in the late 1800s. So it goes back to my question around when do, is it, when do you wear it? When does one wear it? Can everyone wear it? And when you're talking about exportation, you know, then like who want, who was buying them? Who, who else was wearing it? What was it sort of people that had immigrated out or like were all people wearing it different different ethnicities like just yes us yeah yeah no definitely yeah kimonos everybody was wearing it kimono literally means thing to wear so it's a very catch-all phrase for i mean what we might say clothes i mean there's different forms of kimono for men too for children there's one for weddings that we commissioned them to make for the exhibition actually which is wonderful and so there are different forms it's kind of like a same shirt dress <laughs> so there are different forms um, but yeah. basically they do have the same maybe proportion wise there might be some slight differences also there's long sleeve ones are more for younger women who traditionally haven't married yet would wear but the one that the clientele for Chizo, their customers are mostly kind of elite or upper class because even today, Chizo's kimonos could start about like 1500 up yeah. <laughs> and it's worth it. I mean, it's because of all that labor on the intense studios. As I mentioned, we commissioned one kimono from their head designer, Mr. Mai Atsuhiro. And, at, and this is actually the scarf that. That I was going to ask the you. geometric. <laughs> he um, took inspiration from the leaves changing in the autumn in New England and also in Japan, too. They have great appreciation in their arts and culture, especially for seasonal change. And yeah. so they also have this tradition of kind of leaf peeping, and it's called in New England. So he created a wedding kimono 
um, with this design. First of all, how did you go to approach them? You know, I imagine it was quite yeah. a thing, right? Yeah, when we first approached them, so I went to kind of do reconnaissance. I mean, that's what we usually do when we start talking about partnerships, some sort of project. Of course, we go and see the kimonos, see what they're also interested in accomplishing if we worked on a project together. And so it was just great. They also just had their 460th anniversary <laughs> of the company. Right. Uh, they literally just had that. And I think it was a good time because like I mentioned, they're very exclusive. They also are very discreet, which is true of many um, large companies in Japan and elsewhere, Paris too. You know, because you said your colleague went in in the middle of the store and nobody knew who she was. Like, how did you even get into yeah. that first thing? Because you didn't have an appointment or anything, right? Yeah, no. So she got the contact, like generic <laughs> information for the company. And then she finally got the contact for the curator of the collection there. So then I reached out to them and especially working at a museum, they took us very seriously. And also, I think they were very excited to be taken seriously too. Or I, I shouldn't also say that in the textiles and the fashion world, they are very well recognized. They have worked with Dior. In 2020, they collaborated on the menswear for Dior. And so they are pretty well recognized, but they have never shown their kimono abroad and in such a way, like an exhibition. So as I mentioned, they just celebrated their 460th anniversary of the company. And they're just always thinking about what's next, how to stay fresh. So they were very interested in talking with us to exhibit historically all the way until contemporary times, what they have been thinking, especially designing kimonos, that evolution. And they were very interested in education because mm -hmm. that is so important to them. I think educating the public about the kimono, the importance of the crafts, the techniques and preserving that too. So that's very important for them. Is it important that, again, you say it's the eight panels, it's sort of fairly fixed. I mean, the design, the form of it, mm -hmm. how adaptive are we? Because, you know, in the 21st century, you know, would you have one that goes above your knee? Do you have a mini come up, like, you know, like a mini, I mean, how uh, much are we willing to, or are they willing, or the, in tradition, willing to sort of, you know, veer away? Like, what, what does it mean to preserve it and yet be contemporary, I guess, is my question. I think the form or the cut stays pretty close to the kimono, because working with them for that many years, also I, respecting that to their honoring this tradition, as well as keeping it going forward as well, is, is very important to them. And I think part of their innovation is also adaptability. So like I mentioned, they work with Dior and many other companies as well, where they can translate perhaps not the form, but really, as I mentioned, kimonos is about the surface beauty, the ornamentation, the decoration. So yeah. those techniques, those beauty, it's astounding just to see those techniques come to life onto a cloth, a plain cloth. I mean, it's just beautiful. So those, they can translate very easily and offer that to um, other clients, partners in the fashion world. So they have, I think also have found great success in doing that. And because they have this 600 artisan community that they have cultivated, they sustain. And that was one of the great things with, uh, with commissioning the kimono. We got to get a little behind the scenes look at and visiting uh, a lot of the artisans that were working directly on the commission. There's one particular artisan we visited who uh, works on using a barrel, to, uh, it's a very special um, barrel to dye clothing, like large swaths of cloth. And then he said already the person who makes the, these special wooden buckets that the last person who knows how to build them has died without a successor. So that knowledge has also left. It no longer exists. And mm -hmm. so, um, and then he said also, he's the last person who knows how to seal those buckets. So right. he takes very care of those buckets, but also he, um, and we asked him, can't you get an apprentice to keep, to preserve that knowledge, that such wonderful knowledge you have, or else this whole technique goes with you. 
And then he just talked about, I mean, he's kind of resigned. He understands that this labor intensive work isn't appealing to a lot of the younger generation. So you do kind of see also as we were visiting all the artisans um, studios, and then you kind of also see which ones are the younger generation are more gravitating towards kind of more the finishing techniques like gold leaf techniques or the use and dine where you actually see because it's step by step each studio adding their own layer onto this fabric canvas. How many layers would be added onto a single canvas? Well, it's it depends also on how expensive <laughs> you want to make this kimono. But um, for the wedding kimono, oh, we had about seven techniques, and that was because of, there's the seven hills of Wooster. I think they were um, also making a nod to the collaboration of the Kyoto and Wooster, and so that was a lot for them. Usually it's maybe three, four. You know, is there a conceptual person at the beginning who says, you know, okay, tell me about yourself, you know, and we'll tell you how we're going to make this kimono? Or it's yeah. a collaboration with the buyer, I guess. Is, what, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it is a bit of a collaboration, mm -hmm. but the designers, so um, the head designer of Chiso was the one we worked with, uh, Mr. Umai. And he would talk with us about some ideas, especially like important landmarks or concepts that we would like to include. And then he would go back and then he gave a presentation proposing different designs. So it was a fluid discussion in that mm. way. And then he would be the one who kind of orchestrates the collaboration with all the artisans too. And he's always thinking, it was interesting also, we did an interview with him and his background and how he came to kimonos. He was an art school graduate in painting and he mm. came to kimonos because he was very interested in also crafts. But yeah, it's a lot about the techniques too. And it is a wearable art too, which I think is very important. Yeah, so it's wearable. All I can think of is if you're at a wedding and you have a glass of champagne and you spill it or some red wine, like how do people- <laughs> yeah, I think that's the worst case. I think that's worst case scenario right there. Well, no, but I mean, well, no, but if it's, but it's. I mean, we're not talking about you here. We're talking about people in general. I right? understand, but if these are these kimonos are worn in big celebration or you know in ceremony, you know this idea. And have you worn one? And like, what what does it feel like to wear one? And and you know, does it feel like I'm wearing art because they are tend to be like art? Like, so do you feel like you have to behave differently? So I haven't personally worn one. We did joke about for the opening of the exhibition, can we borrow a cheese of kimono to wear? But um, but sadly, the um, because of the pandemic, it was meant to open April 2020, which didn't happen. So it, we had to make some adjustments to the exhibition, and there was no big giant opening. But yeah, it, the kimono, it's you wear many layers underneath the kimono before you finally get to the beautiful kimono. It's all about flattening and making your body into kind of like the backing <laughs> for the kimono. So it is in a way conforming the body a bit to the kimono. So you're, right, yeah. so you're conforming the body to the form. Yeah. And yeah. so that you can actually see the, the design. Beauty. Exactly, exactly. And and also talking with Mr. Mai about like how he approaches the designing of the kimono. It's also, he's literally thinking about oh, where does this design live on the body? And so how like a peak of red when they turn so you can see the lining. <laughs> I mean, so it's very much, he's thinking of it as wearable mobile art too. It's not right. um, stationary. So when you started to think about this as a as a project did you go in and look back at the 500 years of of kimonos and how did you decide and and what uh what you were going to take from all of that you mean like how to contextualize the well or, or or just which ones i imagine if they have 500 years of kimonos in there oh, yeah. you, you probably is, which one are you going to put in the exhibition you yeah. know how do you decide uh -huh. you know that kind of thing no, definitely. I, that's a great question. I should also mention that for the first 300 years of their existence, they were at, not making kimonos. They were mm. actually making Buddhist vestments. Oh. So this is very much tied to Japanese history and modernization. Mm. It was um, Buddhist temples that were patronized by the court that were great patrons of the textiles. So it was only in the 1800s when I mentioned the uh, shogun, shogun courts then um, kind of declined in power. Oh. And then also the um, Buddhism was seen as 
kind of a foreign religion and so there is less patronage of that stable client in that way right. so then they started looking towards innovating and seeing the kimono as another um, outlet for their innovations and also their techniques so that we did think about including some buddhist vestments um buddhist robes <laughs> that they created like in the 16th century but then um, that would have kind of distracted from this story. So their story of the kimono is a very modern story as well, which I think um, really excited me and thought making me think about presenting kimono as a contemporary art practice rather than yeah. a practice that's no longer of relevance uh, either. So yeah. when you look at those first ones from the 1850s, what do you see in terms of the tradition that's now? You know, when you see Dior taking it, what what is the connection between that 1850 to now? You know, you mean like their well, collaboration with Dior, or no, no, like they they start. You know, when you look at that that actual kimono from the 1850s, mm -hmm. would the person who made that recognize what's being made today? No, definitely. I'm glad you brought that up. That is one of the revelations when working on this project. I mean, pretty much went every summer to visit them and get to know more and more. And it was one day the curator of the collection showed us a kimono that was a favorite of a lot of the designers there. And it's actually a 16th century kimono, but it looks so modern. It's a beautiful abstract asymmetrical kimono showing um, kind of a jar of liquid that's spilling from the shoulder right to the, to the down to the hand diagonally. So I'm seeing that it makes you question what is modern. I mean, right. that kimono from the 16th century, you can call modern. That, I mean, I can see somebody wearing that today. So, and that is also the designers are looking at these historical kimonos for that reason, because that inspires and informs their making today. And I think in all contemporary art, it's a lot of artists are always looking to past artists, um, masters who have innovated at the highest level to inform their own creations. So I think that's something that tends to get lost in thinking about what is contemporary, what is modern. And so that was the central concept for the exhibition project. You saw a kimono with the liquid being poured across and it feels contemporary. It was done in the 1600s. Like if you saw one from the 1980s where they were trying to make something that was super modern, was the one from the 1600s more contemporary, you know? Was, was there art, artisanal things done back then that really translate to now? Uh, no, definitely. Are you talking about just the um, relationship between why from the 16th century there? Um, well, what I'm wondering about is whether we get caught up in certain time periods now where we make things that are maybe a little bit goofy because we want it to be super modern and mm -hmm. then versus somebody who really understood what it was and just built, made these really beautiful things in the past. You know, did they always, mm -hmm. has, the, has the company always understood the tradition? They must. They have, yes. And I think it's also if you think about the word tradition as well, it seems like a very, we use it all the time to talk about something that's kind of stale or unchanging, but I mean, it's something that inspires, mm -hmm. something that's more changeable too. So. I think especially um, Chizo, their kind of company logo or company slogan is um, straight to beauty. Uh, so it was also a strange conversation going back to your question about first meeting them too, where we were just interested in, oh, you're making kimonos today. So how is that like? And they're like, well, we've been making this for a long time. I mean, they always, it's not about time. It's not right. so right. how they think. And it was just so great in that way to learn about the kimono through their eyes, about how it's not about this is in the past, this is right. now. They're, they're thinking about the beauty and especially for the kimono for them, it's about bringing out the beauty of women, especially. Um, and so the woman the female changes and that's something that continues to change and the idea of beauty continues to change and so keeping up with that though that concept rather than thinking oh we, kimonos have been made this way in the past and now we need to change it i mean they're thinking about how to make the person who wears this beautiful can i ask a question about that you know 
in the world that we live in, right? Where now we live in this contemporary world, there's you know many different gender identification and we're talking about cultural appropriation and all of these different things. Is, do you, and maybe you don't know, but it, first of all, would it be okay for a man, you know, to like Billy Porter wants to wear a kimono. Okay, I'll just take that as an example. What is their thought around that? And, and that you might know of, or you might have a point of view. And also are the kimono, the ones that you're talking about on this incredibly high level made to be seen or really to be worn? Cause they are art. So what is the relationship between that? To be seen and to wear them. Yeah, I mean, well. you know, they're, they still feel like I'm still worried about spilling something on it. Just, <laughs> but, but you know, I mean, they made them. To, you know, people wear them. So, and mm -hmm. also this question around can different gender wear them? Actually, the kimono is um, genderless. I mean, the kimono is uh, Yogi Yamamoto, who has actually he's one of the designers who works directly with Chizo when he just started as well. For their 460th anniversary, he um, created a kind of a genderless kimono. And that is, the kimono is genderless, which I think is what appeals to many people. It's not like a dress is this gender or is like where, where is the fashion? Because it's not about form fitting. It's not about the, the silhouette. It's, I mean, it's about the beauty of the surface. Right. And the beauty of the wearer as well. So I think the kimono is just perfect, I think, for especially a lot of these discussions about gender that we're having and the fluidity of gender, especially that is being embraced today. I think um, the kimono does add a um, something new to the conversation, especially in fashion and in clothing. So. Yeah, it's exciting. Anybody ever wear one to the Met Gala? They must have, right? Yes. Or, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's why it continues to inspire um, designers everywhere. I mean, it's very beautiful. So it was great to work with them. And then I still keep in contact with them, especially after um, doing such a intense project. And just to give a shout out to um, some of course. I mean, exciting projects here that um, I get to work on. I mean, I guess my interest also in um, his historically underrepresented or also um, neglected artist as well as Chizo runs through my curatorial practice. And so uh, um, right now we have up a show called Slip Zone, post-war abstraction from Latin America to, and East Asia. And so I worked with my two um, fabulous curators and contemporary art also here, um, Catherine Bodbeck as well as Vivian Crockett. Catherine, she's a specialist in Latin American um, art and and Vivian Crockett is a specialist in African and African diaspora art. So, and then my own specialty in um, East Asian um, modern contemporary art. So we were able to create this amazing show uh, about how artists during the 50s, 60s, and all the way into the 70s from Latin America as well as East Asia, mostly Japan and Korea, were looking at each other and dialoguing with each other, whether it was through actual travel or just seeing each other's works and publications, which has been wonderful. So just creating that those kind of dialogues that usually get lost or not really centered on in the narratives about art. So yeah. that's wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Wonderful to learn about this. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thanks, Thank you. Be well. Thank Thank you. Take care.